is a member of the Historical Society. Uh, he's the owner of the Aerial View Photography. He's an FAA certified United States pilot and a longtime resident of Meriden. Before he starts, I just want to show you that we have an exit sign back there, the exit door there, the exit door here, in case we need to leave suddenly. We do have uh, bathrooms in the, in the basement. So if you need to use the facilities, you can just take the elevator down to the basement and take a right in the right there for you. All right. If you're not a member of the Historical Society, uh, we have pamphlets on the outside of the door here. You're more than welcome to take one and to become a member. As of today, July 28th, we have 215 members. So congratulations, 215 members. And one of those members, I'm so glad to, to introduce Sam Carr. Thank you, Mike. As Mike mentioned, um, I am a pilot. I got my uh, private pilot's license in the early 90s. I sold my plane about five years ago, so I no longer uh, fly airplanes. Uh, but I find the drones are just absolutely incredible. Bought my first uh, commercial drone six years ago uh, because I have a good friend of mine who just walked in the room here who showed me a photograph that he took with his drone, and I was just wow. I mean, there was absolutely no way that uh, I could not have one of these things for the perspective that they uh, give. And uh, just as I like to joke all the time, he's always spending my money. <laughs> um, I have three of my drones up here on the uh, counter if anybody wants to take a look at them. Uh, I have two of them skinned in fluorescent colors because I don't try to hide from people. I want, uh, I want to have high visibility and I want to be able to see the drone when I'm flying it. And the farther I can see it, the farther I can legally fly it. Uh, the one on the far right, this little itty bitty one was just purchased for a trip that I'm going to be taking to Canada in uh, September. And Canada has some very strict rules about flying drones over 250 grams. So the manufacturer of that, of all of these drones, manufactured that one, and it is 249 grams. <laughs> <laughs> so it meets all of the uh, requirements that I will be able to legally fly it in Canada. I'm going to talk about a little bit of that uh, in the presentation. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, this works out the way it's supposed to. To see if we can move this. It's always fun to put names of these. There we go. So, tonight's presentation this is uh, the only video that I'm going to be showing tonight. It's just, you know, my flying over uh, uh, the green to do an intro to here. I've broken this presentation down into four parts. Uh, the beginning is going to be aerial views of Meriden, which is what Mike originally approached me about, just to show different perspectives of Meriden. It'll include the, the Green, Hubbard Park, Jafrida, a lot of buildings in downtown. I'm going to spend a few minutes on drone rules and regulations. And then I actually was created, recreated some images that were that I found here at the Historic Society, aerial photographs of Meriden uh, taken from anywhere from the 30s on. And I've recreated a number of those to show the change in our city. And if we have time, I also have some uh, aerial maps uh, that have been taken by Connecticut uh, from 1934 through, yeah, you'll, I thought you'd like that, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, I did that early one morning. I thought that would be a good intro to, uh, to this presentation. Let's see. I may have to, I'm just going to walk back. It's going to be easier. I find on this PowerPoint, if I mess this up. So, as I said, Hubbard Park, Castle Craig, some of my absolute uh, favorite places to fly the drone. I took this photograph about five years ago. I had bought a new lens for one of my uh, cameras. The first drone that I had, had, by the way, it had a wingspan of about yay big. It was huge. Weighed eight and a half pounds. And with the batteries, it had about a 15 minute, 20 minute flight time. I bought a new lens for it. I went over to Hubbard Park just to kind of take a look and play around with it. And I was not really anticipating to take a photograph that I would keep. And I took this one and I really liked it. Uh, chose uh, the 
fair view observation, uh, which we all call the halfway house uh, right there in a nice perspective to Castle Craig. I've then since gone back over the years and recreated the same photograph in each season, this being spring. Oops. I pressed the right buttons. Um, summer, I took this one earlier this year. The other ones were taken later. Late in the, I took this photograph late in the day, so the uh, halfway house is kind of shaded in here. I also want to compliment the Meriden Parks Department. About 10 years ago, they realized that the halfway house was not only not visible, but you couldn't see Castle Craig from the halfway house. And they went in and they cleared all of these trees behind here. And it, you can't really see it here in the summer, but this is all cleared out if you hike up there. And you now have an absolute great view of Castle Craig again, which we had lost for years. As a kid, I used to hike up there and you could never see the castle. And there's an autumn photograph of uh, the same area. And you'll see that uh, I didn't always line the drone up exactly the same spot because I kind of forget where I went. Mm -hmm. uh, a more typical view of Castle Craig with the drone. Um, it shows an area that we don't normally get to see. You know, these absolutely incredible rock cliffs that are out here. And if nobody's ever purchased it, there's a great book out called The Trap Rock uh, of the Connecticut Valley. And it shows all of these, and it gives a wonderful history of these trap rocks. And they're just incredibly great to photograph. Again, Castle Craig uh, with our heart on it during COVID. And this is the, I guess, coincidental shot with the drone, just looking straight down, giving a very unique perspective of, uh, you know, an area. And again, it's something that most people don't get to see. Coming back down from the castle um, a couple of winters ago, I took this photograph just because I loved all the lights uh, lining it. We had a little bit of uh, cold weather, so we had some ice on the pond. Too bad we didn't have snow, it would have been, would have been perfect. But. It just, you, can't have, you can't get everything. Uh, this past spring, I took this photograph, just trying to, again, recreate a similar photograph. I'm trying to go back to some places on a regular basis and recreate some of the same photographs in each season, just so that you can get a sense of them. This is a photograph I took this spring that if you didn't know Hubbard Park, you might not even realize this was a drone photograph because this is about 30 feet off the ground. Um, this area here, as we all know, swings by over here. And I'm just about well, a little bit above the you know, stone wall right there. But what's nice with the drone is you can actually position yourself into some very unique positions, take the photograph. The drones today are incredibly stable. Um, the green drone that's there is my newest one. I've taken up to a five second exposure with that photograph, with that drone and still had tack sharp photographs. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing as a photographer, we need to put the camera on a tripod. I mean, there's just no way you're gonna get a, a photograph that's worth having. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when you're, you can't handle it like that. Uh, Meredith Green went down one evening for a sunset. Sunset didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. So I, hung around for a little while longer and uh, was able to capture this nice photograph with uh, the various lights around. And I guess these red light, I think these lights change colors at different times of the year. Uh, they're LED lights. Again, I went down right after a snowstorm. This Projector doesn't show really well, but there is not a footprint anywhere on the snow. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of nice to be able to fly the drone around and compose your photograph and not leave any footprints and be able to take photographs without footprints in them and not walk across something and then say to yourself, oh, I should have taken this from 10 feet back. And realize that if you go back to take it 10 feet further back, you've got your footprints in there. And uh, Many of us have done that more times than we care to admit. Another photograph uh, of the green, I'm not sure if it was that same morning, but we do have footprints coming down and through here. I will sell, I'm there all times of the day, uh, early morning, late afternoon, midday, 
and the critics of the green who say that it's not used, don't go there because it is used. I mean, there are people walking and jogging. There's kids riding their bikes there. There's elderly people, uh, you know, hobbling along with their uh, strollers, which I will be sometime in the, I guess, near future. <laughs> I got a couple of years to go, but it eventually will come. Uh, this was taken quite a few years ago with my first drone, right after a snowstorm went down and I love fresh snow on the ground. So whenever I can, especially a light dust, one to two inches of snow is just perfect for the drone and get it up there and get some really nice images. And the snow also hides a multitude of sins. It just it covers, it covers a whole lot of stuff. It just makes things look pretty. Griffin Park. Uh, this is the waterfall there uh, a couple of autumns ago. And again, this is a perspective you can't get with a normal camera. I mean, to set up a tripod with this, you would have to have a ladder that's probably 10, 15 feet tall and you know, set up something with a tripod to be able to capture an image like this. With the drone, I was able to actually just go up as high as I wanted to. I took a number of photographs this day and I just love this perspective of the water falling over it, the, the reservoir being there, and of course the uh, golden glow on the uh, autumn, autumn leaves. I will say that today's presentation is primarily stills. We, I showed one video, but I will say that the drones are truly in their element with video. I mean, it's just the, the video that I capture on this is breathtaking, but it just, it's a different, different presentation. Uh, again, Jafrida Park, uh, a different autumn. Uh, it's great to be able to get up, see the colors, get it from a slightly different angle, and uh, be able to move around and move around quite easily with the drone. Took this photograph quite a few years ago now. Um, City Hall, driving home one day, heading up East Main Street, and the light was hitting St. Andrew's Church here, just absolutely beautiful. And I stopped set up the drone, took it off, took off, and uh, captured this photograph. And I loved it. Um, I did, some people asked me uh, about it, and yes, there are some Photoshop uh, issues with it. There's no lights around here, the parking meters are gone, stupid signs are gone. I didn't think they added anything to the photographs, so I got rid of them. Uh, it was, one interesting thing was about eight months after I published this photograph on Facebook, I think somebody at City Hall must have seen all this and said, oh my God, our steeple needs to be painted. <laughs> because they painted wow. it. <laughs> it was about eight months after I took that photograph that I saw a scaffolding going up around uh, City Hall and they were scraping and uh, uh, painting that, uh, that steeple. And it does look a whole lot better uh, with this. And again, what's nice with the drone is this is a photograph that you just can't normally catch, and it's a perspective you can't normally catch. We've got the church here in the background. We've got uh, the old uh, Augusta Curtis uh, Library, now the Augusta Curtis Central Center. I believe this was the Isaac Lewis uh, Mansion, which is now a uh, Muslim or uh, a Muslim uh, temple. Uh, you just get to see some great perspectives uh, with the drone. The original Meriden High School, now our Board of Education building. And this photograph is not quite, the projection is not quite doing it justice, but I never noticed all of this detail. There's skeleton all through this brickwork right here. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible when you get up there with the drone and you start looking at the detail that's in this building. This is all detailed brickwork all through here. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's just stunning. Um, to go through. But it's a nice photograph of the uh, Meredith Board of Education. Uh, you can see, uh, I think that one's Mount Lamentation, and this one would be uh, uh, Chauncey Peak over there. Uh, I get a couple of them confused at times, and uh, I'm sure I will trip over my tongue about uh, the different mountains before the evening is over with again. St. Andrew's Church, just classic. I mean, it just, uh, this church catches my eye every time I go flying around downtown. And uh, three years ago, 
I actually did my own little project where I went around the city of Meriden and I photographed every church in the city for Easter and published them on Easter Sunday on Facebook. My original intention was just to go around and capture buildings like this because I'm just I'm awed with the architecture and just how gorgeous they are. And we've got St. Lawrence back here in the uh, background here. We've got the green. Um, but I decided once I got started with the project that I would do every house of worship within the city, including all of the little storefront uh, houses of worship. And I published them all. I just felt it was the fair thing to do. Mm -hmm. So quite a few of the next uh, slides are gonna be some of the various churches that I took for that project. This church is the, I think it used to be St. It was the Episcopalian Church. Um, I think it was St. Peter's Episcopalian Church, but don't All hold saints? me. No, it's Unitarian. Unitarian, Unitarian, yes, Unitarian, Unitarian Church. Uh, the Episcopalian Church is over here. This church is not there, in, uh, there they've moved. This steeple is rotting away and you can barely see it in this resolution, but these are holes and there's actually some trees growing up out of this uh, steeple. So it's only gonna be a couple of years before you're gonna see somebody up there dismantling that. And I, I suspect they will not replace it. They will just dismantle and put a flat roof up on the top. Uh, that's just my guess. Uh, one of my photographs, uh, I don't live far from here, so I tend to go down to Broad Street, and these two classic churches right here, um, I photograph quite a bit. There is a springtime photograph, photograph of this over here that I printed for somebody, and then they decided they wanted it on a more of a, a glossy type of paper instead of a mat. So I brought this down. If anybody is interested in purchasing this, you can pay whatever you want for it. All the proceeds are going to the Historical Society as well as the uh, note cards that I have uh, out front, um, if anybody is interested in those. Um, they're, they're just here to help raise a little bit of money for the Historical Society. Church on East Main Street. I think this is the Episcopalian Church. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thanks. I knew I was gonna get I, I, I'm gonna get more, I'm gonna get more wrong as we go along. Uh, this is the church that's over in Bradley Park, uh, which I, I, some of these neighborhood churches I just thought were so cool as I started driving around and, and looking at these. Uh, St. Mary's, I do know this. Uh, I love this photograph. Uh, our mayor, Kevin uh, Scarpati, called me a couple of years ago and asked me if he could use this photograph as the city's holiday greeting card, and I uh, gave him the rights to it. And it's just, it's, it's just, a I think it's a classic New England photograph. We've got the church here, we've got their school, the rectory is over here. But right here, we've got all the working class families that would go and they would be working in the downtown area uh, years ago at the factories and they would be going to these churches. Uh, South Mountain is right here, East Peak and West Peak over there. Again, fresh snow makes everything look great. Uh, this is the Greek Orthodox Church down by City Park. Absolutely beautiful building. And it's just it's a stunning building, and it's tucked away in a neighborhood that uh, frequently most of us don't. Many of us don't go down there, but I mean it's just an absolutely beautiful building. Chauncey Peak. So I actually had a lot of slides on this. I had to call a lot of things out of uh, this presentation because. Uh, Few of my friends know that I can get a little bit wordy at times. Um, this is what we see right now from Jafrida Park. Susie O'Fori is over here, and this is our view that we're so typically that we see from the city of Meriden. This is what it looks like from the backside. And very few people kind of see this. You kind of get a glance of it from the highway, but um, there's not a whole lot left of it. And there's not going to be a lot more left of it, you know, pretty soon. And it's kind of a shame, but um, I just thought it was also a cool picture. And we do have, unfortunately, some buildings that are not in the greatest of condition. Uh, this is the old uh, Meredith Medical Center. 
Uh, they just had a fire here. It was right in this area here. This was one of the factories. I don't know if it was a Charles Parker factory or an Silco factory. Was the factory <laughs> for Silco? All that fun area. Yeah, and all this was uh, factory building right here. And there's uh, slabs right here. This was all factory buildings right over here also. This is the old Meriden uh, Wallingford Hospital. Um, it's, I've taken quite a few close-up photographs of this with the drone and it is just in deplorable condition. Um, this is a building that is near the Meriden Medical Center. It's kind of buried right now in this green jungle. Um, Harbor Brook runs right through here. This was the old grill and rail factory that was part of was that part of factory H? Well, I knew it as grill, I knew it as grill and rail when it was part of the Charles Parker Company. Charles Parker Company when I worked there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you know, and there's a there's a, a bridge right here that goes over Harbor Brook. It's yeah. uh, uh I, I doubt it's safe to pass right now. In fact, when I went over this building, these are all holes in the roof. You can see right down uh, through the through the building. Uh, this, we're going to see this again later. Um, this right here was the um, Wilcox White Organ Factory. And in the 1940s, it was a GE, uh, either supplier production factory right here. Uh, this is the building on Tremont Street that they're talking about making apartments into. That's the Iolian. Pardon? That's the Iolian building. Iolian building. Yeah, I not only sure some of the old names, but I, I do know this is where they're planning on doing some uh, apartments. Uh, this, I think somebody told me it was the old Meriden Rolling Mills. It's on Britannia Street near center. Is that, it's accurate no, name? No, no, no. That was the old GE building. That was a GE building also? On Britannia. Yeah, okay. My grandfather worked there. Again, you can see that, I mean, there's hardly a window that's intact here. Oh, Railroad Salvage. Railroad Salvage was there for years, yes. I couldn't do aerial photographs without including, of course, the uh, Curtis uh, Memorial Library, now the Augusta Curtis Center. And this is more of, uh, again, that same shot that I was talking about before. It's a classic film shot where you're just looking straight down um, at the building. The Rosa Poncella uh, band cell here circle there they're just great perspectives you don't get to see it i actually flew the drone around this entire area right here and i don't know or is it this level here i don't know if people have ever taken a close look but there are all of the old greek and latin authors and philosophers engraved into this building socrates plato uh homer um, I believe Shakespeare is on there uh, somewhere, but go down there and look sometime. And right, it's right up in here. You just have to take a look at it. But all of those were engraved into this building when it was built. And I never noticed it before I started flying the drone around there, looking for it. I live on the east side of Maryland. And every now and again, I get up in the morning and I look out my window and I see fog. And I curse myself for not getting up even earlier and going someplace interesting to take photographs. And then I remember I have a drone. So I just launch it from my deck. I get up about 150 feet and I get these wonderful photographs of the fog uh, in the Meriden Valley. And I've also, with these drones, I've taken some great time-lapse photographs where uh, every five seconds it'll take a photograph and the drone just sits where I tell it to and it'll just sit there and take the photographs. And I'll come down after 20 or 30 minutes and I'll have a great 15 to 20 second time lapse of this fog moving all through the valley. And the building we're in, the old, uh, originally the Meriden Electric Company, then CLP, then I think it was a barbershop museum. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and now, it's yeah, yeah, Meriden Silver Museum. And now it's us, which is great. Drones, rules and regulations. I, Try not to bore you with this too much. Uh, there are two basic categories of drone operators in this country, hobbyists and commercial. 
Anybody who has a commercial license can get paid for flying the drone. If you're going to take photographs of anything and get paid for it, you need to have a commercial license. The FAA calls it the Part 107. I got my commercial license uh, six years ago. I'll be renewing it again at the end of this year. Um, drones have to be registered. They're a whopping $5, and it's been for, I believe, three years. So there's absolutely no reason for people not to register their drones. And the only drone that doesn't need to be registered is that little one I picked up earlier. The rules say 250 grams and over. So I will probably register that anyway. Uh, just such a thing to show. Uh, on the hobbyist uh, thing, they now have a trust exam. It's free. It goes over some of the basic rules that I'm going to hit uh, in a moment, and it's a very easy test. I teach a summer class. I'll be teaching it again in August this year for the Manchester school system, and I'm teaching uh, basically middle schoolers who have an interest in drones. And last year, I had about 70% of the students that were in my class pass this trust exam, and it had only been available since the week before. So these were 12 and 13 year olds that passed this exam, and there's absolutely no reason why anybody should not take the uh, you know, quick tutorial and take the exam. Legally, that's how high you can fly your drone, 400 feet above ground level. Technically, as Mark, Peter, and I know, probably get that baby up to about eight, nine, 10,000 feet. <laughs> Lots of rules busted with that one though. Uh, one of the reasons we have a 400 foot, one of the reasons we have a 400 foot limit is because airplanes are not supposed to fly below 500 feet unless they are taking off or landing from an airport. So that gives if everybody pays attention to the rules, we've got a hundred foot buffer between the drones and the planes. No flight over people. You're supposed to keep the drone in visual line of sight, and if you're going to fly at night, you need to put strobes on. I have strobes for all of the drones. Um, I can see those drones about three miles away with the strobes on them. So um, I can travel a long way and still be in compliance with the FAA line of sight. Prohibited areas. You cannot fly a drone in any of the national parks. You cannot fly them in Connecticut state parks. Uh, controlled airspace. Somebody was asking about this earlier. Any airport that has a tower, Bradley, New Haven, uh, Hartford, Danbury, uh, not, uh, Oxford now, all have towered airports. You cannot fly in those spaces without getting permission. Permission's not that hard to get, but it's there for the safety of the airplanes. And you know these are controlled airspaces for a reason. As a pilot, I cannot fly my plane into a controlled airspace without permission just can't do it. So there's no reason why a drone should be allowed to fly in these same airspaces without permission. Um, the Department of Defense and some other sensitive military sites, not only are you not allowed to fly there, a lot of them now are geofenced where you cannot fly into them. And if you bust through the geofence, there's a very good chance you are never going to see your drone again. They're taking this very seriously and prisons are the same way. We didn't have an issue in Connecticut, but there were incidents when drones were first coming out of people flying paraphernalia over the prisons and dropping them uh, by a release cable so that the inmates could get their drugs or their knives or whatever they, whatever they needed. Uh, again, the prisons in this area are all geotagged, geofenced, and you cannot fly in. This is the FAA's map for Meriden, and it shows all of the controlled airspace in Meriden, which there is none. Because our airport right here is not a powered airport. I disagree with this. I know too many people that I've seen flying their drones over here at Hanover uh, Pond, and that is right in the flight path of uh, the Meriden Airport, but it's legal. Shouldn't be, but it's legal. This, I, my three drones are manufactured by a company called DJI. They are the 800 pound gorilla in the uh, consumer and prosumer market. Um, and they are geotagging their own air, uh, airspace. And this is a restricted airspace around the Meriden Airport and it fans out as it gets higher. These are the two uh, restricted airspaces. 
prohibited airspaces actually over in Cheshire. They are the prisons. These maps are not totally accurate. This is the Maryland Wallingford Hospital. It's showing that it has a health board, which it doesn't because it doesn't exist anymore. The health board is over here. This is CN Flag Company. CN Flag doesn't have a health board anymore. CN Flag doesn't exist anymore. So you do have to have an understanding that these maps are there, but you also need to do your own research to make sure that all of this information is valid. Uh, this is a picture of an FAA website that's called the Lance. These grids are all controlled airspace. This is Hyannis right here. This is the uh, Air Force Base that's out of Cape Cod, and this is the Bedford. Within each of these grids, there is a height limit as to how high you can fly and get uh, immediate permission. Out here in the outer area, you can get full 400 feet. As you get closer to the airport, you get into what are called zero grids and you cannot fly in there. This is the Cape Cod National Seashore, and it's red because you are not supposed to fly there. The brown areas on this map are the Connecticut State Forest, or Connecticut State Parks. And again, they are not allowed to be flown. So if you have a drone or you know somebody and you think they're going to get out and capture some great images at Hammond Asset, don't do it. It's, it's, a, it's a way for a quick fine, and you'll probably lose your drone. So this was an interesting statistic that I found as I was just doing some research for this. And just to show you how drones are multiplying so rapidly. This is as of the end of 2021. 865,000 drones registered. 315,000 of them are commercial. There are only, there are 280,000 commercial drone pilots, the part 107 that I have. Uh, and there are within a year, 257,000 people have passed the trust exam. So that tells me people are taking that <coughs> exam and it's a knowledge exam very seriously. We can't really see this, um, but these are the FAA statistics for the actual number of airmen. And what I thought was interesting is the number of private planes, not the, not the big boys, not the American Airlines and such, planes that I have. There are only 205,000 of them as of 2020. There are 865,000 drones. Okay. This is the growth of the entire aviation industry right now. Um, companies are using drones for all kinds of reasons. And it's just going to continue to explode. If I was uh, 30 years younger, I would be definitely uh, doing some type of a serious drone career. I get asked the question all the time, have I ever crashed? And the answer to that question is there are only two types of drone pilots. There are drone pilots who have crashed and those that will crash. <laughs> <laughs> this is a client of mine's. Uh, I fly this site every month and I have a program flight for it. And this is the highest spot in the whole area. That site, that spot right there is 350 feet above ground. And I have my flight plan at 400 feet. So I have a 50 foot safety margin. And one day for whatever reason, the altimeter didn't work properly in my drone. And it ended up in the very top of one of those trees. Um, not a happy site. I was not a happy guy that day. As you can see, it's cold. <laughs> this is a very, very, very steep climb all the way down through here. Uh, I went up, I found the drone first. And then I called my buddy, Tim, Tom. <laughs> and Tom was a tree climber. <laughs> and Tom climbed all the way up here. And there's my little drone right up there. And he rescued it. And that's the orange drone right there. So it cost me $250 to rescue my drone, which was a hell of a lot less than buying a new one. This is uh, one of the quarry sites that I do fly monthly. And I, I fly a grid pattern over this quarry. And from that, they are able to take all of these photographs and stitch them together and create a 3D image of their entire quarry. And from that, they are able to measure 
the volume of each one of these piles of stockpile. And they know how much half inch stone they have, how much two inch stone they have, how much silt they have over here. I've also watched this rock face over here slowly erode over the last year. And they know how far, they can measure how far back every month I go there, how much is there, and they know how much volume of rock has been taken from there. And it is supposed to coordinate so that they know that when they measure going out, that they have the right volumes. I find it very interesting, but it's one of the, it's one of the drone clients that I, I do. I do quite a bit of work with them. And this wasn't that site, but this is where the, uh, the drone got hung up was on a site like this because it was supposed to be an automated flight, uh, automatically automated right into the trees. So I'm gonna get a short drink of water and we're gonna get into, I think what many of you were looking forward to, and I was looking forward to this. I started this project and I came across a photograph that I'll show you in a moment. It started my interest in this and being able to recreate some of these uh, views. This photograph was taken in 1865. Obviously, it was not taken from a plane. Um, it was taken, I believe, from the steeple of the Meriden City Hall. And it was looking west. They called this, at the time, West Meriden. We refer to it as downtown. Um, this, and this is the Meriden Botania Company right here, South Mountain, East Peak, West Peak over there. This is First Congregational Church right here. It's now somewhere over there. Main Street was just Main Street. This projection is not really showing it, but in detail, some of the, excuse me, some of these houses still exist along East Main Street. So that was taken from our uh, city hall uh, a month or so ago. And uh, you can see that First Congregational Church has moved over here. This is St. Mary's. St. Andrew's is here. We now have uh, East Main Street, West Main Street is up over here. These are the back of the buildings, the Colony Street, Railroad Avenue would be right around here. The Meriden Green is over here. Just to give, to give you some orientation. I, I do have, one of the advantages of being a pilot for over 25 years is I, I have a great visual of where I am when I'm looking at aerial photographs. They, they kind of come second nature to me. This is just the same photograph. Uh, it's just a colorized version, so you can kind of see it a little bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just didn't want to jump right from uh, uh, an old black and white to a color. The post office is right over here. You can see that a little bit uh, better now. Uh, this is trolley, and again, this was taken from the Meriden uh, City Hall. I believe this was in the 1890s when the Meriden had uh, quite a trolley system going on up through here. Uh, a couple things you can point out here. Uh, center, First Congregational Church has moved, should be somewhere right there. Uh, uh, Meriden Britannia is still in this area here. I think that might be it right there. Uh, the mountains are still there. <laughs> Again, taken from Meriden City Hall. Um, I believe somewhere around 1900, uh, we got our, uh, at the time, the Meriden High School, now Meriden Board of Ed, St. Andrews. We got a, uh, See, we got firehouse right here. This is the Meriden Britannia Company, right in through here. Uh, First Congregational Church is right here. And we've got, I think these are all Meriden Britannia uh, Company factories also, uh, right in through here. But kind of a, it goes to show you there's a lot of house mixture between both commercial, industrial, and residential right in our uh, town center. Uh, that's the best I could recreate that. Our uh, St. Andrews is right here. Mary Green is right here. First Congregational, that's St. Mary's now. First Congregational, I'm sorry, is right here in the backs of the buildings of uh, Collins Street. Uh, let's see. 
So this photograph, I believe, was taken from that tower in the Mayor of Britannia uh, company, just because of its elevation. And uh, it's for, these notes up here say prior to 1889, but past 1885. So somewhere in that four year time span is where this photograph was taken. This is the back of that firehouse again, right here. We've got the, uh, Please help me out. Is it the Methodist Church on East Main Street? The Methodist Church. This is their first church that was there. It was a brick building uh, right here. St. Andrews. I will tell you, as I was going through these, I, I fell in love with churches because they are such easy landmarks to be able to recognize again. Uh, this was uh, the City Hall at the time. And again, the Meriden High School Board of Ed. And our two churches, uh, Broad Street churches, are up here. And I think one of the things you start to look at when you realize this is just how close everything was in there. I mean, this was a real walking area. Again, uh, a recreation photograph. You can see that all of that uh, building that was on Pratt Street is no longer there. Pratt Street is considerably wider right now. Uh, Catman Street is quite a bit wider. The library is over here. Uh, we've got the Methodist Church. Again, Board of Ed. St. Andrews should be right there. And uh, our two Broad Street churches are up here. So this was the photograph that started this whole project. This is, uh, I believe, the Manning, Manning Bowman? Manning Bowman building. This, of course, is now the Kennedy building. But I thought it was interesting that there was this triangle building in what is now just a park. And uh, if you'll notice, and of course this is uh, green, but this was all housing back and through here. Notice how narrow Pratt Street is and how narrow Captain Street is. And that's one of the reasons why when we jump to the next photograph, you'll notice that this green is nowhere near as large as this building is. And it's because it was taken and, you know, the, the street was widened. Which made it all uh, over the Asia. So uh, again, now this is the Kennedy Building, our public library right here, Meriden Board of Ed, and the Meriden Green right here. And you just see how much wider Pratt Street has become. And even Captain Street is considerably wider than it was before. That's not good. Uh, this was not a drone or aviation shot, but I thought it was interesting. I believe this was uh, the uh, American record, warning record uh, for the 1906 uh, centennial. And uh, doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> not even close. I did take some photographs when they were tearing down the uh, uh, record journal building. And just to jump back to this, if you notice, we've got the morning records right here. We have other standalone buildings right here. And then we have very crowded. I mean, we have these buildings here, which would be South Colony Street. What I thought was interesting was during the demolition, this whole facade looks very uniform and the same, but the structures of those old buildings were never taken down. You know, they just uh, made do with them, probably made some cutouts to get in and out between them. But the building had one big facade, but it was really several old buildings that were in the back of that, as that uh, demolition photograph shows. So this photograph, obviously, is not in good condition. Um, as I looked at it, I was trying to figure out where the pilot was when he took this uh, image. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that it was not taken from an airplane. It was taken from Hubble Park at Castle Craig. Mm -hmm. And I did that by lining up these steeples. As I said, I have to love these steeples. And there's City Hall right there. And so it was a relatively easy photograph to go back and recreate. You know, just uh, drive up to Hubbard Park, set up the camera, and take a couple pictures. We got Mount Carmel down here. You know, the towers are over here. Uh, again, City Hall is right here. These are a bunch of aerial photographs that I found uh, here at the Historical Society. 
Uh, this is the area, this is St. Mary's right here. So this is that neighborhood that's up behind it. And uh, Grove Street would be right about, Grove Street would be right here. So this is like Hillside and up in that area, West, West Hillside. Right there. there are some gorgeous houses uh, back up and through here on the back of uh, Lincoln Street. Lincoln Street would be right around here. Uh, those houses are absolutely stuck. Anyway, I had some restrictions with this, so the perspective is totally off. Uh, this was taken at eight, 380 feet, so I just couldn't get as high as that other photograph was, and camera angle of view was quite a bit different. But this is that same neighborhood today, and again, you can kind of see how we've got the Mary Green back over here. Uh, we've got good old St. Mary's is right there. So this photograph is captioned viewed from the first congregational belfry. And the first time I went down to take this uh, photograph, I hadn't realized that first congregational had moved on Colony Street. So I took off and I was hanging around the, uh, the current first congregational church and I could not recompose this photograph any way that I tried. It just, uh, every angle was wrong. And I finally just realized that I just need to go further down Colony Street. So I just flew the drone down Colony Street and until uh, I got a, uh, an angle that looked about right. By the way, I had printed all of these photographs uh, and I had them in my car for weeks. And as I would drive around, I would stop and say, oh, let me see if I can recreate this photograph here today. Mm -hmm. um, and this even, there's a cap, uh, I think it's on the back side of this uh, uh, photograph that says that none of these buildings exist today. Mm -hmm. So that's, an approximate of where that other photograph was taken. These were some aerial photographs uh, taken, I believe, by the City of Meriden or maybe the Record Journal or something like that. And they're uh, photographs of the, before it became the green, it was the Meriden Mall. And this was as they had cleared all of those buildings out of this area. Catlin Street used to go all the way across, that got closed off. So notice Harbor Park. It was all open and was open in uh, some of those other photographs that uh, we saw. It was covered in just a few places. The Meriden Mall covered the entire area. And that was one of the reasons why we had such terrible flooding down in that area was the culverts would uh, uh, fill up. So that's more or less the viewpoint today. This is an old etching. Uh, from, I believe, 1875. I could be wrong on that year. But this is the uh, Meriden Britannia Company. Uh, railroad tracks right here. Um, the perspective, I, I have a lot of respect for these artists. I think it was phenomenal that they could draw a photograph as a bird's eye view without having the ability of having a drone or a plane or a helicopter to be able to walk and actually see what these things look like. They're drawing these uh, images from basically being on the ground. Um, not a feat I could have right now. But anyway, the perspectives are off a little bit. You'll notice these hills in the background are way too large. I mean, they're, they're just out of perspective. Um, and you see that here. <laughs> you know, they're just not, not quite there. And again, part of the problem here is this is a much wider angle lens than that had. But if we go back to this, it also shows you this nice hill here, the trees growing. And then this was a factory. This was not trees. This was this was down, this was West Meriden. There were buildings on Colony Street. This is Colony. I took this. This was taken for Colony Street, which is running right along here. Here's the post office. Gallery 53 is right here. Uh, the home club is here. The Meriden Boys and Girls Club, I think, is there. Uh, Railroad tracks are running right through here. This was H. Wells Lines Company years ago and the Meriden Mall in its heyday. I believe this was somewhere in the uh, mid 1980s, this photograph was taken. And it looks quite a bit different today. Uh, the home club is gone, the boys club is still there, the post office is somewhere else, but the building is still there. This is still Colony Street. Here's Gallery 53 here. All this was factory or uh, you know tenement housing and such, and it's now our, our green. Uh, this was the H. Wells Lines Company, uh, where that parking lot is. Uh, this was their building, but 
the system of Mori there. Uh, this photograph was taken. Well, here's, here's Manning and Bowen right here. So this was downtown again. And I believe this is going to be the Mary Britannia Company. Here's the post office where they're here. This is Lincoln Street up here. And East Main, East Main Street is down here. Uh, this is St. Andrews right here, just for another brand reference. And you can just see how narrow Catlin Street is right there. Again, I have to take a panorama. The perspective is terrible. I apologize for it, but it's the best I could do at 380 feet. Uh, the other photograph was probably taken at about 1,000 or 1,500 feet. Again, the Kennedy Building, very green, and where the uh, post office was. This one's not going to be as visible as I had hoped it would be on this screen. This is St. Mary's right here. This is the uh, Meriden Wallingford Hospital right here. This is Cooper Street, where uh, uh, Yankee Gas used to have the storage tanks mm -hmm. down there. Uh, City Hall is right up in this neighborhood here. This is Hanover Street. West Main Street is running along here. Just to give you some perspective, uh, if you look at this on my computer screen, you can actually see the departure out over here in a little bit more detail. This is all undeveloped out here where the mirror square will eventually go. And that's more or less uh, the picture that I was able to recreate. Again, Mary Wallingford Hospital, Hanover Towers. This would be Cooper Street. This is where those uh, uh, tanks, the gas tanks would be over here. So this is the uh, Wilcox White Organ Factory on Tremont Street. And there's one building left out of this whole series right here. Uh, but there were some, there were a lot of railroad tracks back in those days. So a lot of spurs uh, going around there. Uh, Napiers will eventually be back in this area here. This is all just field right now. This is, this building here, I believe is this building here. Okay. So these Fonsa Hub buildings are all new. Um, I did follow this down. There are remnants of an old railroad track running right through this building here, but right along this green area here, which would have gone back around this building and out in that direction there. International Silver on South Broad Street. Uh, I think this was taken in the late 50s. Uh, I took it uh, a week or two ago. Let's get the colorized version. There's International Silver building right there. This was all that gorgeous lawn they used to have. It is now the strip mall. And such that we used to, you know, when we used to drive by this, this was all just lawn space. And here's Broad Street, here's South Broad Street right here. And Silco Field over here. And again, Broad Street, South Broad Street is right here. There's the Silco uh, office building, factory back over here. And this is all was built over that uh, expansive front lawn they had. Uh, let's see, Colony Street, I believe. Yes, Collins Street. Mm -hmm. We created we created with the drone early one morning. Uh, West Main Street. I think this had to have been taken from somebody's uh, third or fourth story uh, window, just hanging out, just so based on probably the corner of the Grove Street. This right here, yeah. The uh, and I uh, recreated it as best I could with the drone. Uh, let's see, West Main Street looking west. Uh, we've got our, our tower here, Wayland's uh, Drugstore, which will eventually become uh, Jefferson Federal Savings Bank right here. <laughs> and what it's looking like. 
So these weren't aerial photographs, but I found them interesting. I found a bunch of these uh, as I was uh, looking for old photographs here at the Historical Society. And this was taken as Hubbard Park, I believe, was being developed, if not very shortly after it opened up. Um, got a few differences to it right now. Uh, like you noticed, this is gone, this is gone. <coughs> and that is uh, the entrance to Hubbard Park these days as we see it. This photograph is from some dry plates that I bought a number of years ago at a tag sale. And I believe these were the late 1890s to 1900. Castle Craig is not up here yet. So Harbor Park is being developed at this time. This is the goldfish pond. It doesn't look like that as we know it. There's a bridge going over this uh, little waterfall right here. And you'll notice none of this is developed. This is all just undeveloped uh, uh, land that just goes right down into the pond. And for those of you that have read uh, Justin uh, Piccolillo's uh, book on Hubble Park, he has talked about uh, boats being in uh, you know, this little lake right here. And there's one. Not much of a not much of a lake to paddle in, but <laughs> anyway, this is a photograph I took a couple of weeks ago. And again, Castle Craig is quite predominant now. Uh, we've got the nice stone bridge over here. So I believe those other that other photograph was while Hubbard Park was still being developed. This is uh, the reservoir that's in Hubbard Park. It used to have a caretaker that lived right there. This was his house. This was the old gauge station. That was as best as I could do to reproduce it. The house was gone a long, long time ago. The gauge station was taken down a number of years ago. So um, just based on, I was basing it on these rocks up here when I was taking these pictures as to uh, where we were. How am I doing for time? Okay, we're running a little bit late. Okay, I'll, I'll speed up. I believe this is Hubbard Park. I believe this is the summer of 1900 when the castle was being built. We've got a lot of construction uh, material over here. There is no, there are no stairs inside the tower yet. And this is not finished off. These are just big boulders in front of the park. And this is a big boulder right here. And that's pretty much what it looked like a couple weeks ago. All right, I'm gonna go right through all of this because Mike told me to keep to 45 minutes to an hour. And I'm, I'm, hitting, I'm hitting 55 minutes. Um, I can do another presentation on these aerial things later, but I'm just going to kind of skim right through them. This is downtown Meriden, 1934, 1951. And again, part of the reason this needs a much better resolution projector to be able to see this kind of detail. Um, this is uh, 1970. The mall is built right there. These other uh, photographs, this was this is where the mall was going to be. Oops. Uh, yeah. So mall. the mall, and then start to see 691 being built through the city right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how it the uh, uh, the sex the city. Right, okay. This one is in uh, 1990 with the uh, 691 completely uh, finished. Uh, the mall is still there. And this is in 2010, I think. The mall has been cleared away, but the green has not been done yet. The 691 is still uh, and will always be. Uh, this one here is the Maryland Square. This is Target. And this is Mid State Medical Center over here. Hubbard Park, 1934. This was Hubbard Park. Here's uh, the Fairview, uh, let's call it the halfway house right here. Castle Craig is right up here. Undercliff is over here. This is uh, West Main Street. And this is the uh, big reservoir, Merrimer Reservoir that's uh, within Hubbard Park. Again, Castle Craig, halfway house. Uh, we, this is 1951. We still do not have a highway. 1970, they have cut Hubbard Park in half. 
went through there. Oh, let's go back just quickly to this. You can very clearly see the old trails. These are the old trails that used to be through Harvard Park, the carriage trails. And if you follow this back out, this it loses something. There's a, there's a great bridge right over in this area here that is uh, a great walking trail. But this clearly shows all of the wonderful trails that were in the lower part of uh, Harvard Park. And that's uh, 1990 with the uh, highway completely finished and completely dissecting Harvard Park. Okay. Sorry about the blanks. Uh, this is Bradley Harvard Reservoir sometimes called Crescent Lake out by uh, the golf course. Uh, this is the quarry right here. Chaucer Peak is right here. The golf course is right here. And quarry is right here, Chaucer Peak, the golf course. This is now Route 15, okay? If you remember in 34, that didn't exist. That is now uh, part of the landscape. This is now, uh, again, Bradley Hubbard Reservoir. You can see the quarry taking a little bit bigger chunk. The golf course is a little better to find. The cameras they were using were uh, quite a bit better. Uh, 15 is here. Development is all up and through here. And uh, let's see, 1970, we've got uh, I-91 has been completed over here. 15 is still over here and the quarry gets larger. Sorry, I'm editorializing about the quarry, but I remember as a kid hiking all through these areas up through here, and you could get lost up there. And the last time I hiked up there a couple of years ago, I was shocked at how uh, how little of that space is left and how the border is just eating it all up. Oh, yeah, I left this one blank for a pur purposeful reason. Uh, last month, uh, Mike did a presentation on uh, Salvatore Poli and he talked about his uh, house down in the Woodmont section of Milford. And I've, that has been on my bucket list to take a photograph of for quite some time. So thank you, Mike, you motivated me mm -hmm. to get out and take a picture of it. This was uh, Salvador Poli's residence right here, mm -hmm. this breakwater out to this really cool gazebo right here. And all of these red tiled houses were houses that Poli had built and they were part of his compound so that guests, visitors, entertainers that were working in his various theaters could stay right there. And I, I've always wondered about these buildings, I've always wondered about these buildings because I used to do a lot of work down in this area of Milford and I didn't know the history about it. So thank you, Mike, for that last year. And my last photograph is going to bring us right back to Castle Point. One of my favorite places to photograph with the drone. And this was early one morning. I did two years ago. I got lucky. Uh, the light was nice. The clouds were nice. The flag was there at half staff from Memorial Day weekend. And the spring colors were just kind of nice. That's it. Mm -hmm. Questions? Who has questions? questions? Yes. I'm sorry. It's a when you are flying your drone, you're trying to recreate an image that you already have. Some of them. Or, or some of it. Can you, do you see what the drone sees from the ground or are you just positioning it? And yes. So I actually had this running beforehand. If anybody wants to come up and take a look at this, I took the props off so that nobody can fly it. <laughs> um, in a moment, that will cycle up, and the iPad that's just behind it will show you the camera, wow. and that's what I'm looking at. I uh, the the way these work is I am looking through the drone's camera, and that's my visual cue, so I can see exactly what I'm taking a photograph from. The uh, the sides of the drone, uh, this one, these two right here, this here, down on the bottom. And on the sides here, these are oh, gotta be over here. Sorry, <laughs> out of frame. Wow. Uh, the way the drone, the, uh, the more sophisticated drones work, these two here, this here, and on the back, these are all collision avoidance sensors. 
and they will not pick up small tree branches, hence my collision in the trees uh, that I talked about a moment ago. But if it was spring or summer and the leaves were out, it would not have allowed me to fly into that area. It would have stopped. And it will not allow you to fly into a building or a person. I could take this drone off and try to fly it right into that wall. And it's going to stop about five or six feet uh, before it gets there. And it's going to say, hey, you may want to kill me, but I don't want to die. <laughs> and it just stops. So they have become very, very sophisticated. Uh, this is not true of the $200 toy drones, but all of the, all of the professional grade drones have these kind of sensors in them. They also have uh, sensors in them that will tell us how much battery time we have left. And this one and the green one both have uh, automatic sensors in them that if I fly too far away, the battery will, the drone will automatically determine if it has enough battery power to return to where it took off from. And it will automatically institute that return to home when it ha just has just enough battery power to get back. So every, every generation of these is getting better and more sophisticated. Um, they're kind of like computers and cell phones. Every two years, they are leapfrogging uh, at an unbelievable pace. Yes? Uh, what's the cost? The cost for your drones? Oh, uh, let's see. This one, when I bought it, was around $1,600, $1,800 with a couple of spare batteries. Uh, the green one was around $3,000 uh, for it. The little one that I, I just purchased was around uh, $900. And that was purchased for a very specific trip to Canada, but I'm absolutely loving that drone. And by the way, this was purchased for a trip to Scotland uh, four years ago. Scotland at the time had rules that said drones under a thousand grams could be flown without a flight plan and without a, uh, a, a UK license. And this weighs 980 grams. So, <laughs> my other one weighed eight pounds. So there was no way that was gonna fly legally over in the UK. Um, and now, uh, yeah, so I put these into my travel budget and then, but I have, I have, uh, honestly, I have, I've paid back every one of these drones with, uh, either selling images, uh, the commercial flights that I do. So, um, it's a little bit more than a hobby. Beautiful yes. pictures. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you. I, I, I enjoy it. I'm glad, I'm glad you all enjoyed the photographs. I tried very hard to recreate those, uh, you know, now and then photographs. And a lot of the angles weren't exactly right. But as Peter and I, I don't know if many of you know, uh, Peter's a longtime photographer here in Meriden and uh, probably one of the most talented photographers I know. And he looked at me and said, oh, that's going to be a chore. <laughs> you have all these different angles and the, the, the lens and the field of view and all this. So you, you do as best you can. Okay, I'm getting the I'm getting the thumb right, Mike. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> is the hook going to come out there? The hook is going to come out next, <laughs> and, and Salvatore is going to pull me pull me off the side. <laughs> any, any other questions regarding Jones or the photography? Wow, I covered it that well. Thank you. This is if any. I get, I get